Okay, we're going to let everyone roll in. As Katie said in the chat, welcome to Coffee Chats. We'll give it a few more moments and then we'll dive right in. Hope everyone's having an amazing, balmy <laughs> weather day here in Washington State in Snohomish County. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. We'll just get started now. My name is Gary Clark, President and CEO of Economic Alliance, Nahomish County, and you are with us for Coffee Chats. Please raise your coffee cups or water or whatever you have in there. Let's see, Nicole has some, Sandy, Colin, Anna, okay. This morning, I come to you with some great news. Today is June 22nd, which actually means that it is National Chocolate Eclair Day. I know, I know you didn't know that, but uh, just quick notes. So Eclair from a French word, which actually means flash of lightning, right? And they, they actually called this uh, Duché um, in France. And it was way back in like the 1780s, 80s or so this was made so uh, and no I did not bring any to our office so if anyone wants to bring EASC some chocolate eclairs we would welcome them all right with that in mind we have a very very important uh, message to provide today and prior to that as always we like to make sure that you are giving us your information so housekeeping number one Add your organization's name so that we know who you are when you are participating in the chat. And with that in mind, please, please engage us in the chat. This is going to be a very important topic. And so if you have any questions at all, I think our two speakers would love to hear those questions, even if you need to repeat it just because you didn't hear it previously. We want to make sure that we give you as much information to be edified today. So. Moving forward, we are lucky enough to have two speakers. And I'll just highlight briefly, Sandy Wood is president and chief benefits consultant of the Benefits Academy. Uh, she's worked in and around benefits field since 1990 as a benefits analyst, service representative, agency owner, operations manager, product developer for a private healthcare exchange and benefits producer. Now she serves as a consultant to agents, brokerage firms, insurance carriers, and benefits related vendors. Welcome Sandy. And Sandy has done a lot of work in this field. And second and last but not least, we have Mr. Colin F. Samson II. And he comes from CFS Planning Resources. And he began his career, he began his career actually in 1985. Uh, I know they're dating you here, Colin, and I apologize for the dates here, but in 1993, Colin started his agency beginning a career on an independent insurance agency producer. And in 2020 or 2011, actually, uh, Medicare and long-term care consulting began, uh, became his focus of his practice. He also holds numerous certifications, which Colin will not share with us because we have a lot of other things to talk about. So with that being said, we have our awesome speakers here and I will let them take the lead. Good morning. Thank you for having us. I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen. And I'm just gonna jump in here. Um, the Washington State Program, um, and I'll give you a little background of me and Colin. It's really great that both of us are here today because I'm more the education gal and Colin is the insurance guy. And so um, I know a great deal about the Washington State plan. Colin does too, but he knows even more about the insurance side of an opt-out program um, that's available. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is the many names of the state plan. So the state 
it's under a revised code of Washington. So if you are a geek like me and like to go in and read these things, you'll see we have some hyperlinks throughout our program. We'll be providing the slides, the slide deck to the program. So when you receive that, you'll be able to click on these links and get into what we're talking about. Um, but the state, we called it a bunch of different things. At first, we called it Washington's long-term care because in the industry, in the insurance industry, we call long-term care services, long-term care, LTC. Um, but when you go to the RCW, it's actually called the Washington Long-Term Services and Supports. That's what the state has always called the Medicaid programs for long-term care services. So all of a sudden, we were calling it LTSS Trust Program. Um, but then the, the state put in um, the Washington Cares Fund public facing site. And so now we're calling it the WA Cares Fund. So Colin and I may call it different things. Just know that it's, it's the state's long-term care program. Pretty much we'll, we'll try to call it the state's long-term care program as we go through. Sure, and then um, moving on, um, you know, a big part of this presentation today will be educationally focused. And um, we want to make sure that everyone viewing um, understood that there is a website now that explains these, this new plan um, along with the tax in greater detail. So um, please avail yourself to that at the bottom, you can see the website, and I encourage everyone um, to go there and um, you know build upon your knowledge as we go along. So just a quick breakdown of the tax that's coming. Um, the state does call it a premium assessment. Um, most everybody else is calling it a um, payroll tax. It's 0.58% of wages. So if you make $100,000, you'll pay this uh, $580 a year, but there is no cap on wages. It is um, all W-2 wages. And no cap means that instead of stopping that tax at the social security cap, like they do for the paid family medical leave that we had to put in, um, that was put in two years ago, instead of having that cap, there is no cap. Um, so if you make $200,000, then you'll, your tax is going to be $1,160 for the year. Uh, the more you make, the more you will pay into the system, but you won't get more benefits for paying in more to the system. Uh, the payroll tax starts on January 1st of 2022. It's fully employee paid. The employer does not pay any part of that unless the employer would like to. Um, you're not required to. And the commission is going to review that, that um, amount, that 0.58% every two years. What's included in that is base salary, bonus, commission, vacation, termination settlements, um, even the value of stock at the time of transfer to the employee, if it's given as part of a compensation package. So every W-2 dollar uh, is going to be taxed. Uh, there are a couple of things that will not be included. Uh, one of them is tips. That's the same as the, the paid family medical leave. Um, tips are not included in the taxation. And then I keep bringing up the paid family medical leave that was put in two years ago. Um, there's also um, an exclusion for the supplemental payments above the PFML benefits. And what that means is if someone qualifies for paid family medical leave in the state of Washington, the Washington State Employment Security Department pays them a percentage of their salary. Some employers pay additional up above that. So say if someone's getting 70% of their salary uh, paid while they're out on a qualified paid family medical leave, Sometimes the employer will give money over and above that to get someone to say 90% of their salary or 100% of their salary. Those supplemental payments are not going to be taxed underneath this long-term care program. And then they also have less than 72 hours of armed forces service. I'm not quite sure what that um, 
details, but someone was telling me maybe that's um, someone who's coming in and working off the clock for for someone. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what, what that is. So if anyone knows what that is, please type it into the chat. Hey, um, Sandy. Yes. That's scary. I, I see that you're in presenters mode and I thought maybe we'd uh, have you shift it to uh, presentation Oh, thank mode. you. Uh, just so that we're not uh, sneaking a peek of, at your next slide every time. Oh, sorry about that. I thought oh. I was sharing the correct one. So let me find where my share button is again. Take your time. Everyone's searching for their chocolate eclair purchase. So. <laughs> I have three screens open, so I'm trying to find my my little uh, Zoom. Oh, your share screen. Okay. My share screen on Zoom, yeah. Hmm. All righty. Now that I stopped sharing, it won't let me share again. So I think Katie can give you that. Um, authority again. Okay, you're all set to, to share again. And it looks like we got a comment from Jennifer with the uh, uh, the question on the military service piece. Oh, nice. Do you want to give that comment while I'm trying to figure out how to find my ruler? That's my yeah, problem. Sure, oh, there we sure. go. So 72, 72 hours of military service would roughly equal one weekend of reserve military service. That may be what is referenced in the law. And I think she talks about the deployment in state might be taxed, but not a short term weekend service. Uh, but she, so she's guessing it hasn't been, uh, <laughs> I haven't read the law closely just yet. And I think a lot of people are still trying to uh, peruse the law right now. Having any luck, Sandy? I am, um, Zoom is not showing me my bar. So let okay. me end a whole bunch of things here and um, see if I can get it back. Totally Zoom fine. has had some issues lately. That's totally fine. I think everyone is 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 used to the Zoom. <laughs> I know. Just wanted to make sure that you, we weren't teasing out your next slide each time, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and it said I was doing the correct one and then it did a different one, so, okay. And Colin, what, what have you uh, uh, prepared for us today while we wait for Sandy to find her, her uh, screen? Well, the, yeah, the um, this is the presentation that Sandy and I jointly um, discussed, and we're going to share um, the presentation oh. together. Yeah, so. Okay. There we go. You got now, it. So sorry. Okay. Dear me. Okay. And thank you for that comment. That makes total sense. I just don't work in that arena, so um, I don't have employees. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, Colin, I'll let you sure. take this okay. one. So um, as we build upon this, uh, you can see all W-2 employees, as, as um, we discussed, working 500 hours a year will be part of this uh, program. And um, those working within Washington State Exceptions would be um, union employees under um, collective bargaining agreement, although 
once that CBA is up, um, they're going to have to be part of it, it looks like. Uh, federally recognized tribes would be optional and federal employees. <clears throat> um, ah, there we go. The uh, little table here shows who, um, under a scenario with the uh, company situated in, say, Oregon, or a person living in Oregon, would they be um, subject to the tax? Um, I'm going to call it a tax versus a premium assessment. So um, you can see various scenarios. Basically, if you're going to be, you know, paying L and I uh, paid family medical leave, you're probably going to be um, forced to pay this tax. So, um, you know, we just use the example of Oregon, it could be Idaho, it could be Alaska, it could be California. Um, and um, yeah, know. and this is where we get most of our questions. Um, is my employee who works in California going to be taxed? No. So it's all um, what they're calling localized work. So if someone works within the borders of Washington state, they're going to have to pay the tax unless they opt out um, if they have W-2 earnings. Uh, we don't know yet um, if they're going to do something about a de minimis opt out. They did that for the paid family medical leave, where if you come into the state to work just a little bit, um, maybe you've got a, an employee in California who works in California, but they fly up to Washington state and work here you know, a couple of weeks a year is that going to be taxed? Um, we don't know yet. It looks like it will be unless they put something in like the paid family medical leave program where you can apply for a de minimis opt-out. Um, they're, they're formulating those rules right now and those should be finalized by September. So more to come on that. <clears throat> So the benefit will start at $36,500 per lifetime. And the reason why I say starts at is because it's $100 per unit and they could increase that to more than that, um, say $105 per unit. Right now it's $100 per unit in the law, 365 units. And at first they had thought to put in $100 per day, but they changed the wording um, before it went into law in 2019 because they realized that people are going to have to stack some of these benefits. Maybe someone's at home and they're getting a meal service delivery and the same day they're having a caretaker come in to care for them. Uh, they didn't want people to you know, not go without food because they're getting a different service that day. So they are stackable. Um, you can use a partial amount, so maybe a food delivery is $50, so that other $50 unit, part of the unit, stays within your bucket of $36,500. And as I said, they could um, change up the, the amount of benefit. It's not automatic. Uh, the commission will do that. I don't see it changing much in the next um, number of years because we're at 0.58% and the Milliman study said we should be at 0.66%. Um, the legislature was hoping that um, people would vote in that we could, they could uh, put the money into other kinds of investments other than very stable investments. And that, um, that was shot down by the people of Washington. So really there's, there's no room to add to this benefit in the near future, just a FYI there. Okay, and I, I might add that um, if, uh, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that this tax will increase over time, um, especially based on the Milliman study. And so that's another thing to uh, keep in mind. Also, um, when we look at the um, provider services, we're we going to the next slide there, Sandy. <clears throat> um, we can make a comment on the 36,500 that that is, um, in most, in a lot of scenarios, that's gonna be inadequate, okay? It's better than nothing, of course, 
uh, and the state program, as we're going to see here in a second, has a lot going for it. But um, in the great scheme of things, uh, you know, you could say it's better than nothing, but it's not adequate. It will not prove to be adequate in a lot of cases. But talking about the, the state program itself, it is very comprehensive. Um, they did a great job of covering um, many of the most, if not all, of the services uh, you will find with long-term care, starting with, you know, what we normally associate with long-term care is nursing homes, assisted living, et cetera. But if you look at uh, bullet point number four, home health care, very important because no one really wants to leave their home unless they really have to, right? Um, I comment sometimes that you either go two ways to a nursing home. One, with your nails digging into the carpet, or two, you think you're going to a picnic. Um, so uh, home health care is very uh, significant there. Also, uh, I think as it's coming on here, Sandy, we uh, wanted to talk about the family caretaker training. So under this program, I think it's, is it 21 hours or uh, Sandy? A minimum state, 21 hours, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, state provided uh, training and for that family caretaker who then can be paid um, for um, their, you know, the care given. So um, that is a very um, important aspect of this um, coverage, which again, I say is, uh, very comprehensive. You know, they did a good yeah. job and they should be complimented uh, on that. Yeah, I definitely like that they are going to train family caretakers. We've got about 850,000 caretakers in the state of Washington that the state knows about um, who are taking care of their family members. And and to me, that's important. My mom took care of my dad and he, he was fragile, so he couldn't go to the doctor's office and he couldn't go to the infusion center and so those very lovely people they trained my mom how to give my dad infusions and so to have a training program for family members i think is is going to be just awesome so i do really like that piece of the program now once you've paid into the program you'll be benefit eligible and once you need the benefits, these are the qualifications for getting those. So you have to be at least 18 when you apply for your benefits. You need to be a Washington state resident and receive your care in Washington. This is a bit troubling because if you want to retire to Arizona or if all of a sudden you need care and you want to uh, move to where your kids are so that they can take care of you, um, that won't be covered, you have to receive your care inside the state of Washington and be a Washington state resident. Uh, with vesting, there's two types of vesting. Uh, the permanent vesting is you pay into the program for 10 years, five of them being consecutive, and then you will be eligible for benefits for the rest of your life, as long as you receive care <clears throat> in the state of Washington. Now, there's another temporary vesting where once you need benefits, what they're gonna do is look back six years and say, okay, have you paid in for three of the last six years? And if you have, then you'll be qualified for benefits. And I'll give you a couple of examples in the next few slides. Uh, you do have to have a minimum of 500 hours paid into the program to have that as a qualifying year toward your vesting years. And you have to have a loss of three out of 10 activities of daily living. And we'll go over a slide that um, gives you exactly what those 10 things are. But first I wanna give you some examples. Hey, to hey, Sandy. Sure. Sandy, can we back up just a second? On the um, Washington State resident um, situation, remember we discussed if you say, um, a 30 years old today, pay into the program for say 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. Then you move out of the state, is it, it's five years, correct? 
and you will lose you will lose that you best lose residency after being out of the state for five years and yeah. so once you lose your state residency it appears under the law that you will not have the benefit you, that you won't get paid back your premiums that you put into the plan you just will no longer be eligible yeah so all that money that you have paid in you'll never receive the benefit for Correct. Inter interesting, you know, how they set that up. So, mm -hmm. so the examples, this is a, someone, here's Sebastian, he's a regular employee, he just pays into the system, works 500 hours or more every single year, starting with 2022 when this starts. And you'll see that I calculated he's, temp he's under temporary vesting as of 2025. Because when I look back the six years, he's paid in for three. And so he continues being temporarily vested if I pulled that um, box down until he gets permanent. And so here's his permanent box. I look and see, oh, he's paid in for 10 years. Five of them are consecutive. Great. Now he is permanently vested. He retires in 2033. And for the rest of his life, as long as he's a Washington state resident and receives care in Washington, he'll be eligible for the program. Uh, this question we get a lot um, because you have to pay into the system for 10 years to be permanently vested. So what happens to those people who don't have that much longer to go toward retirement? Even paying in for nine years is not gonna get you to the full vesting. So here's Janice who's retiring soon. She'll pay into the system for four years. And you'll see that she's got temporary vesting just like Sebastian did. But as I bring down that box right here, if she were to need the benefits in 2030, she would not be eligible. Because if I look back six years, she's only paid in for two. So now she's no longer eligible. So that's why she's temporarily vested, but she loses that vesting after that timing. So it's very important to understand that some people can be, can be eligible for the benefit and then no longer eligible. Um, I get questions too about, well, what if Janice only worked two years and then retired? Well, she never paid in for three years, so she never would get to temporary vesting. So it's a bit complicated the way that they've set it up. Hey, Sandy, I wanted to ask you too um, on, on going back to that slide, because it certainly penalizes those in their early to mid 60s. Um, have you heard any uh, discussion of perhaps correcting that or trying to? No, uh, they, they uh, we've asked, you know, if they could do, if they could, and they, they just say, well, we have the temporary vesting in there. I mean, yeah. most people don't, won't need the benefit right after they retire. Um, what some companies are doing quite interestingly is they're putting in uh, positions that would be, you know, 550 hours per year. And so their retirees are not really going to retire. They're going to continue to get enough hours to mm -hmm. continue getting a year of vesting into the system. Um, so just a little enticement for people to continue to work a little bit during retirement, so. Yeah, un unfortunately, I don't think a lot of small to medium employers would have that. Yeah. Ability. <clears throat> so it really is unfair to, uh, I, I guess a bit of ageism going on, if you will. Uh, yes, and other people have thought that, oh, this is going to end when you turn 65, you'll, you'll continue to work, but you won't have to pay the tax. That's not true. As long as you're getting W-2 earnings, you could be 72, and you're getting, you know, you're working 100 hours a year, you're going to pay the tax on W-2 earnings. So there is no minimum age, maximum age. If you earn W-2 earnings, you pay the tax unless you're opting out. Okay, activities of daily living, we put 10 here, but let's focus on the first uh, five, um, bathing, dressing, eating, et cetera. Um, these, and one is missing um, when we look at a private insurance company plan, and that would be uh, cognitive impairment. Or, I mean, uh, continence, excuse me, continence. Um, 
these are activities of daily living normally associated with a traditional long-term care policy. And under those policies, you'd have to be unable to perform two of those activities or be cognitively impaired. So it's a two or cognitive impairment. Now, when we look at the state plan, they do not include continence in their um, 10 activities of daily living. Um, they do include some others. <clears throat> Maybe body care might come under continence. I, I don't know. But under the state program, you must be able to be unable to perform three of these 10 listed activities of daily living uh, certified by a physician. So it's a bit, um, it's a bit more um, onerous to, to qualify under the state program than it would be under a private plan. Also, um, question comes up, well, if I'm cognitively impaired, that's only one activity of daily living. Under a private plan, I'd be you know, uh, able to access benefits. And the state program, we really don't know how that would, um, you know, uh, be adjudicated as as far as benefits go. I'd like to think they'd give you the benefit of the doubt. So, and I am looking here. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I do want to have a lot of time for questions. So, um, just a, a little bit about why the state put this in. Uh, they wanted to protect workers. Uh, seven out of 10 will need long-term services. Now, a lot of people think, geez, you know, 70% of us won't go into a nursing home. Well, remember, long-term services and supports also includes home care. So it is typical that about 70% will need at least some home care. Um, a lot of people think Medicare will cover long-term services and supports. It, it does not. Um, Medicaid requires you to spend down your earnings in, in any of your savings. Um, and we already talked about the state having so many unpaid caregivers, but they're also doing it to protect the state. So the state's projecting that by 2030, the Medicaid funded long-term care uh, that they are paying out for services will be about $4 billion. And they're expecting that the long-term care program of the state will cover about 10% of that. So um, there, what I look at is they're looking to get people to stay in home longer. Uh, typically, if you can get someone to stay at home, most people want to anyway, but they need the care that they have at home. So if you can get them set up with that $36,500, that may be about a year, year and a half of at home services. And if you get the person set up, they feel comfortable at home, uh, they're able to get to their doctors, they're able to get food delivered, um, then they'll stay at home that much longer. And so we're, I'm looking at it as if they can get you to stay home longer, they're gonna pay less out in Medicaid services than if you were to go into a nursing home. And again, this is just for you to be able to get to these hyperlinks if you want more information about Medicare and what they do not cover and Medicaid and spend down that they require you to do. But there are some people who can opt into the program. Uh, if you don't have W-2 earnings, you can opt in. So that's sole proprietors, independent contractors, uh, member of an LLC. You can opt in, but once you opt in, you're locked in and you only have three years to opt in. So um, all those people who are currently sole proprietors, the clock starts ticking on 1-1-2022. So you have until, what's that, 22, 23, 24, you have till the end of 24 to opt in. Otherwise you're always opted out unless you move to a W-2 um, job thereafter. And then federally recognized tribes, they can um, opt in or opt out at any time. Oh, and, and uh, Sandy, um, we should point out too that the first year benefits are available is 2025, correct? Right, because at 2025, that's the first time anyone would have paid in for three years. So anyone who paid in for three years will be temporarily vested and they'll be eligible for benefits as of 2025. Yep. 
Yeah, so it's a three year pay in before any benefits are, are, yeah. are available. <clears throat> okay, so um, part of this educational process is asking as ourselves, is there a way to avoid this, um, this tax? And uh, there is, and the time frame is short because you would need to purchase a qualified long-term care plan of insurance <clears throat> before 11-1-2021, uh, so November 1st this year. So you must have something in place by October 31st, 2021. If you do not, you cannot opt out and you will be assessed the, uh, the tax um, for the duration of your working career unless they change the, uh, the law or it's a, there's a court challenge. <clears throat> so that is the window of opportunity that, that we call it right now. <clears throat> um, then you would apply for a premium exemption and would probably be online. Um, that system is not set up yet, but uh, once you apply, get approval, it'll be for the first quarter uh, of the next of the next quarter. So for example, if you apply, say in November of this year, long-term care insurance, and it is approved, then you would avoid the tax beginning uh, January 1st of 2022. If it wasn't approved till say January of 2022, you wouldn't be able to avoid the tax until April 1st. No, that's kind of a lot of figures and numbers being thrown out there. But the key thing is, um, if you're interested in opting out of this plan, you need to take action and have a policy in place before uh, November 1st of this year. This would be just through in this slide, um, just to let people know how to get the exemption. We, we don't currently have the rules yet on this. Um, because they haven't set it up yet. Uh, but if you go to the wacares.wa.gov site um, and keep checking there, they should have that up there by 10-1 because that's the first date that you can opt out. So I'm gonna go over what employers must do and then Colin will go over what employees need to do. So for employers, if you're an employer, you're going to need to set up your payroll deductions to begin on January 1st. And then your, your payroll system will need to suppress waivers. So if someone brings you a waiver form um, that they got approved by the state of Washington, uh, then you need to suppress the tax from them. And you'll also suppress it for your non-W-2 employees. Maybe you have some 1099s, maybe your owners are owners of a, um, a partnership uh, then you would suppress that as well. Uh, implementation process, you need to keep the waivers on file. Uh, the employee is tasked with giving you that a copy of their approved waiver, but you do need to keep it on file and uh, you need to suppress the taxation timely. If you take out tax from someone's salary and you shouldn't have, then you need to give that back to the employee and the state's not gonna pay you back for your mistake. Your first remittance will be uh, the end of the month following the first quarter, just like you remit the PFML, the paid family medical leave tax. Uh, you'll also remit the ESD to ESD, the Employment Security Department, the same way. Um, and then I recommend that you look at changing your quarter one bonus timing. If you usually pay bonuses out in January, uh, a lot of companies do, you may want to change that to uh, pay out at the end of 2021 or at the beginning of second quarter of 2022. And I say that because we don't know how many applications for waivers are going to hit the Employment Security Department um, this last quarter of the year, uh, this year. So basically that um, approval that the person receives is going to be effective first of the quarter following the approval. So if someone submits that to the state in November and the state's taking a long time to do their approvals, they may not have the approval until the first quarter of January. 
So it just may be, you know, uh, something that you want to look at for the bonus timing. And will you educate employees? There's no state requirement, but the state is starting to come out with information that you can provide to employees, not a ton of information yet. Um, are you going to talk to pre-retirement employees, those people who have nine years or less in, that they're going to work? Um, because they're going to pay into the system and only receive at most temporary vesting. Um, are you going to offer an opt out, uh, offer opt out information to employees that, hey, you have this tax coming, but you have this opportunity to opt out? Um, and then are you going to offer a group sponsored long term care program to people as an option to opt out? Okay, so what employees must do? Um, one step is today, like we're doing. Learn about the state program. We've given you the website. Um, and I encourage all employees to go to that website, learn more about the state program. I also encourage you to learn more about long-term care insurance. Um, <clears throat> gives you the opportunity to decide for yourself what program may be better? Um, you might ask yourself, well, would I rather pay myself owning a private long-term care form of insurance or would I rather pay the state? Um, and then, you, you know, looking at your options and judge for yourself and decide what you want to do. Um, in some cases, the state program will be um, the better alternative. There's no question about it for some people. For others, um, I think we can make a clear case that a private plan, uh, if put in place in time, will be a better op, you know, uh, alternative for that individual. Um, again, the deadline, 1031 of this year, <clears throat> and then you can apply for the waiver once that system is in place by the state. Um, so, I will harken back to that uh, situation where an employee paying in 20 years moves out of the state for five, they've lost all that. If they had been paying themselves, um, they'd keep that, um, that coverage. Also with long-term care insurance, uh, the benefit becomes available immediately. There's no three-year uh, wait. So again, um, my whole thing is be educated and so you can make the proper decision for yourself. Um, right, and the decision points are, you know, some people, it will make sense to do, to pay the tax. They know that they wanna retire in Washington state. They've got more than 10 years to pay into the system and it, it may make sense for them. The, there's another that you could have long-term care. I know Colin and I talked about this the other day, both he and I purchased our own long-term care policies about 10 years ago, um, partly because we're in the business and we know that the younger you lock in the long-term care policy, the lower your rates are for the rest of your life. Um, but there's also another program and in insurance called life insurance with a long-term care rider. And so there are some options out there um, before 11-1. Obviously, it's not a huge amount of time before we get there. Um, but you know, I'm I'm the expert on the long-term care side. I work with long-term care insurance on the group side, and Colin works with long-term care insurance on the individual side. And then he works with me actually on long-term care on the group side. So hey, Colin, Sandy. I'll let you kind of yes. Sandy and Colin, I, I kind of gave you guys limited time due to my interjection earlier on. So I want to make sure that we have enough time the for next some one questions. Is Q &A. Look at and that. look, we are on par. <laughs> I, I knew that slide was coming. So uh, so what, I, what I'd like to do is we have some questions in the comments section. And I want to make sure that we get to as many as we can here. And I think we had one initially that started out with, uh, let's see, Denise, uh, which the question may have been answered in your conversation here, but it was, what if you pay a medical dental stipend to employees and then deducts, deduct the cost of the medical benefits? Is the stipend taxable? 
And then there's a comment about the paid family medical program uh, said that the benefits stipend was taxable for that program. So if you're providing medical insurance or um, vision insurance or dental insurance, those are all pre-tax benefits. So those would not be included in tax. However, if you're reimbursing someone's claim, so they come to you and say, here's um, a claim that I have for vision services. And you said that you would reimburse me $100 for that. Um, if you have not put that through as a um, Section 125 plan, uh, which is a tax-free program, then that would be considered um, fringe benefits and that would be considered taxable under the program. Uh, it's the same as the paid family medical leave. Um, it would be considered taxable earnings. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, um, and Colin, I want to make sure if you had any additional comments there. <clears throat> no, I think Sandy covered it very well. Okay, okay, we'll move on to Doug's question uh, or comment here. Uh, uh, most of my 40 plus employees are trying to opt out because coverage is so bad, he says, and if uh, they decide to move out of state after retirement, all benefits disappear. Uh, this tax is a solution to a totally different problem than being uh, presented. And so this is more of a comment. So I guess this is just partly an opportunity for you all to opine on, on Doug's comments here. Uh, he says the problem is actually addressing, addressing Medicaid running out of funds. Any thoughts there? Well, and we kind of covered that after he uh, put that comment in there that, you know, the state is trying to figure out how to deal with a looming $4 billion a year as of 2030 being paid out just for long-term care services. And mm -hmm. so this isn't going to cover a ton. It's 10%. That's not a huge amount. Um, but what I think that they haven't taken into account is if you get someone to stay home and you set them up, then it's more probable that they'll stay home longer. And so they will spend down their savings slower if they stay home. So they won't go on to Medicaid as fast. And <laughs> I've actually talked to the legislature about that to see if Milliman could add that into their study, uh, because I think that's important. Okay. And, and you all highlighted this uh, just very briefly, but there was a question about who might be exempt uh, from the long-term care program. So I wanted to make sure if you could reiterate right. that for the group. So the exemption is anybody who does not earn W-2, so sole proprietors um, and those, those types of people, partners in a partnership. Um, the federally recognized tribes are automatically opted out unless they want to opt in. And then the union employees. So if what I'm telling people, it's the same dates that they're using for paid family medical leave. So whenever your union employees have to start paying the paid family medical leave tax, then they will start paying this tax as well. If they have already started having to pay the PFML, the paid family medical leave tax, they will have to pay this one as of January 1st, 2022. Okay. And another question is, do employees nearing retirement need to opt out? Um, those nearing retirement can only opt out if they have a long-term care policy. Okay. There's no opt out because I'm not gonna be employed for a long enough period. Yeah, and those, those, I was gonna add, those people are in um, not the best of circumstances because the um, cost of those policies whether it be a life with long-term care right or a long-term care uh, standalone plan are going to be very expensive for those people. Um, plus, um, there's always the uh, aspect of insurability. Um, mm -hmm. So those people in those uh, age categories may find that the state program is the best alternative for them. All right. All right. Um, there are a couple of additional questions here. Does this tax affect small nonprofit 501c3 organizations less than five employees? Uh, it includes everybody. There are everybody. no exemptions for anyone other than the federal government because uh, they have their own program. 
uh, for their employees and the federally recognized tribes. All other employers, nonprofits, churches, everyone has to pull the tax out regardless of size. And, and Colin, you kind of highlighted the rider piece. You mentioned that briefly. Um, so can you do the life insurance with the rider and it qualifies? Is that? Absolutely, it does qualify. Um, in fact, I think for most, the vast majority of people, I think this will be the better alternative than strictly a straight um, long-term care policy, especially mm -hmm. those, um, especially those 40 and under. Um, the advantages are you have a life insurance plan, you have a long-term care uh, plan, plus you have, um, in some cases, a cash buildup of under the under the life plan. So uh, you have three benefits, all um, start from day one. Mm -hmm. So you start paying into it. If something you know were to happen, um, the plan pays. Okay. Also, the last thing I would mention is that the insurance carriers know what they're on the hook for when they have a life long-term care uh, combo plan. They know that their expenditure eventually is going to be X amount, whatever you know, the policy is, um, the face amount of the policy. So they can underwrite that in a more realistic um, and prudent manner um, so that it's with long-term care, we're finding that um, over the period of time, the underwriters don't really know how to underwrite a 40-year-old, um, for instance. And therefore, um, chances are premiums are going to go up over the life of the contract. Not the same problem with uh, the life LTC combo. And, and so, there may, so Colin, there may be some examples in the near future of the rider and, and, and what's getting approved or eligible through the insurance companies and the state, right? So that people know whether or not they, whether or not that's a, the best option for them. Yeah, and I think Sandy um, might want to interject here uh, mm -hmm. on her, um, her expertise. Yeah. The policy. state did come out and um, say that they're using uh, the revised code of Washington actually has a definition of what long-term care insurance is. And there were so many questions into the state that Employment Security Department kept pushing people to the office of the insurance commissioner and the insurance commissioner kept pushing people over to the employment security department. So finally they came out with um, wording on the OICs, uh, the office of the insurance commissioner's website. And so they've clarified what Colin and I have read in the RCW, the revised code of Washington all along that it includes life insurance policies that have a long-term care rider that are written on an accelerated death benefit chassis. Now in our state, we have two types of long-term care um, riders. One is written on an accelerated death benefit program and the other is written on a critical illness program. The state is saying that if it's written on a critical illness chassis, it will not be qualified because under that type of program, you have to have um, say 24, um, months to live, you need to have a critical illness like a cancer, um, and then you qualify. With the long-term care under accelerated death benefit, that is the activities of daily living. So that's what you really want to look in your policy if you already have one is, is it an activities of daily living qualification? Um, it should also say long-term care in the name of the rider. Um, and so you can always go back to your insurance company and ask them specifically, will this qualify? Uh, most of the insurance companies have come out with position papers as to whether or not their policy does or does not qualify. Okay. Well, folks, um, this uh, ends our Q&A section. And now I would like for Sandy and Colin to just give us uh, their biggest advice or takeaways. Colin, I'll let you go first. Okay, thanks, Sandy. Well, as I said, um, this uh, whole idea today was to present some, some more information to educate 
and then um, we're all adults here. And then you can um, explore your options, judge for yourself. Uh, what is the best policy for you, whether it be with it staying with the state, whether uh, exploring a private uh, insurance company option. Um, Sandy's business, or well, let me put it this way. Um, if you want more information, please contact me. Um, and I will contact Sandy and we will um, coordinate and work together to show you a viable all, uh, group alternative um, to the state program. And again, judge for yourself. Um, that's all um, our, our idea here is. And I also, you know, think about the idea of paying yourself versus paying the state. With that, I'll let Sandy talk about her role in this. Sure. So my end, my end comment is, um, it's who's this good for? Who's better off on the tax versus insurance? Um, I think it's the same as it's always been, with the same question of who. Um, who should be doing long-term care insurance for themselves as a planning tool for their financial future. And it's the same thing. If you're a low wage earner um, and you, you would do the tax. Um, basically, if you're a low wage earner, you're ending, gonna end up with Medicaid. You're gonna spend down, do Medicaid. The tax program gives you a buffer before you hit Medicaid. And so um, that I really like that you can stay in your home. There's a little bit of money there to help with um, making your home the way that it needs to be in order for you to stay at home. Um, the high wage earners are going to be uh, better off just self-funding themselves for long-term care. So maybe they'll take out a small policy to opt out of the tax and then they'll still self-fund their long-term care. But that middle segment, middle America, um, they're, they've always been the ones that have looked at purchasing long-term care insurance because you have to be able to make enough to afford the cost of it. Um, but also that's the segment who may have enough in savings that it would really hurt to have to spend down all their funds in order to then go to Medicaid and qualify. And so, I don't see a difference here with this program. It's the same. It's the different three different segments. It's kind of the same. And I, I don't know if you would agree with that, Colin, but um, that's how I'm I'm seeing it. Well, I, I want to I want to thank you both for uh, taking the time to speak to us about a very uh, important uh, yet cumbersome. Uh, opportunity here for everyone. And I understand the, the true benefit behind it uh, while we need to hash out the details deeper. And uh, so we may ask for more information from both of you going forward, make sure that we have uh, that, that fact sheet put together for folks and uh, maybe even a follow-up uh, conversation in the near future. Uh, sure, so sure. Thank you both, uh, Colin and Sandy. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yes, yeah, so very detailed information, very important. Uh, definitely, uh, Katie can make sure that you all have their contact information uh, going forward. But before we go, folks, we have news for our next uh, Coffee Chats, which is Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, June 29th, 8.30 a.m. here on Zoom. And guess what? At some point in the near future, we're going to have some events coming up that are uh, hybrid events. And so I'm really excited about that. Get to see people in person at some point soon. So thank you all for joining us today. Have an amazing day. Enjoy the weather and uh, have a good one. Take care. You too, Gary. Thank you. <laughs>